Hi, I'm Matthew McCullough, and I'd like to talk to you for about 30 minutes on submitting to conferences and delivering the presentations at those same events. I think with a few quick tips, you'll find that this is not as scary as you think, and you'll have a more cohesive action plan of how to approach submitting to these and find out what will work best for the audience. I'm excited to talk to you about this topic because it's one that's very important to me. I've invested some time over the last couple of years, both on conferences and in teaching and developing materials around how to do this. And I want to see others succeed in this space. And there are many people out there that are perfect candidates to deliver at an event such as OSCON. There's a need for people to share their stories and how they're succeeding in the software development and technical spaces, and your story can be one of those important ones shared with the audience. The book that I co-wrote on this topic attempts to take a humorous but very pragmatic approach of how to go through the process of writing a proposal, thinking about the audience, building up the slide materials, and then delivering that to the ultimate audience at the show. I'd like to take you through some of those steps today, and it all begins at the lectern. Thinking about when you're standing up there in front of the audience, what you're going to say to them, and in fact, why you're going to say it. The audience has a wonderful ability to detect authenticity. They know if you actually care about the topic that you're talking about, and they can equally smell if you don't. Choose one that you're passionate about. This is sometimes difficult to reconcile with your employment situation, but let me tell you it is the single most important thing that you can do for a great presentation. You must very deeply care about the topic. It will make delivery of the talk easier. It will make rewinding a few steps, assembly of the materials much easier, and it will make gathering the data to build a cohesive presentation just so much less of a chore. When you think about some of the great speeches, there are so many to point out, but every one of those has a person behind it that cared so incredibly deeply about the cause and the message that they were trying to get across. The part that's important here is that you're focused on your audience, not on you, and not necessarily on a product, a technique, a tool, or a framework. I love it when the objective is to help the other people in the audience do something that they're doing today better tomorrow than they did yesterday. And that's what the audience members are there for too, to learn something that helps them have a better tomorrow than yesterday. So with that purity of cause at the beginning, let's get a little bit more concrete into how I approach this. I try to choose from one of a handful of categories for the flavor of my talk. I find a skill that I already know that maybe others in the public space don't know as well as I do. You have those. Trust me, there is something that you do better than almost anyone else on the planet. Another angle to approach is something that's common practice that you'd like to have people think differently about. Perhaps to be a little bit more skeptical about how it operates or what its benefit profile might be, or tell a story about how you applied a tool or a framework or a process and it didn't work out. Many presenters make the assumption when preparing for a talk that it always has to be a positive outcome. People learn from examples that didn't work out so well. And when the message is carefully crafted, this can be perceived as a benefit that you're sharing with others, not some negative opinion of trying to drown out a particular technique, framework, or tool. I like to also discuss that in the context of people. It's not always about the underlying technologies. Sometimes it's about how we work together on them. Does this framework have an XML file that we're constantly all competing for, that there's contention to get access and be the most recent one to change? Does this scale well across a team are they all able to contribute to it, or does it kind of focus where one person becomes the gatekeeper? These are process activities and process discoveries that you can share with others who've not yet employed this particular technique or mode of collaboration. And then, what about the lessons that you learned from those interactions? Not just what to use or what worked or what didn't, but what have you discovered, reinvented, polished, and used as your next iteration. How do you approach that same problem, if
if you were faced with it today. These are, again, valuable knowledge transfers that are often overlooked in favor of just purely technical talks and ones that are focused on programming techniques and languages. And last but not least, a technical talk. These are great, and many people appreciate them at conferences, but I do like to put it last in the list because I feel there's an overabundance of these today. Tell us how things worked out for you, and as a fallback, tell us one particular framework, language, or project to look at. Equally important as passion and caring about your talk is investigating who you're giving it to. As many old adages say, you need to target the message to the person receiving it for it to have maximum impact. Does the audience, such as the one at OSCON, have a great diversity in their backgrounds, their employment, government, private sector, banks, medical institutions, perhaps? Or on a more language-specific conference, maybe they all know Ruby. Maybe everyone here is a JavaScript developer. But those are important attributes to discover prior to assembling your talk. Right after you've figured out what you want to talk about and the motivation behind it, you must then align all the upcoming activities with who you're delivering it to. Now, where do you get this data? It's a great question, but the answer is pretty simple. Most conference organizers are delighted to provide you with whatever data they can in the space. After all, you're actually looking to provide greater value to their attendees. Of course, they're going to help. Ask them as specific of questions as possible. What's the demographic of the people attending? What backgrounds do they come from, as we were just looking at? What would they want to learn from a session with a title like this, the one that you're proposing? And if you feel you've extracted all the data that you possibly can from the conference organizer, then proceed next to ask some of the attendees. Maybe you know somebody that's attended this in the past. Maybe you can find a few of the people on a mailing list that still exists from a past year's instance of this conference. Or even go out to the short form media and look for the Twitter hashtag, query some people who attended it and had both polarizing good and bad things to say about it last year, and look what you could do to avoid the missteps, and look what you could do to mirror and repeat the things that seem to be very successful of talks at the past instance of this show. So ultimately, you are adjusting your content, and this is the highest form of respect for the audience that's most likely to attend your talk. You're using their time as wisely as possible, and you're choosing the level of materials that will best resonate with them and their past experiences. I like to, again, make this as tangible as possible. So what are some of the questions that I found myself asking past attendees and the organizers in the past? The level of the audience. We've already kind of mentioned that one. If a technical conference, what programming languages do they know? And what about the diversity of the audience here? This can affect everything from jokes that you might want to use or perhaps suppress to the verbiage that you're going to choose, the richness of the words, the complexity of the phrases that you'll use, and how much reliance you'll place on diagrams to support the audio track when you're explaining something. Another important facet here is the age. Certain events uh, attract an older generation of mature individuals with rich experiences. Other shows tend to be bent towards people who are just entering a field of, of work. So think about that. What do they have in their past? Can you throw out references to past languages, Lisps, Algol, COBOL? Do you have to keep it all just in the JavaScript or Ruby sector? The age will certainly affect those decisions. And then what about their educational background? This seems in the technical space to just keep increasing in diversity. People with PhDs, master's degrees, bachelor's degrees, and then no university experience whatsoever. And yet they're all still productive, functioning citizens of this technological ecosystem. That will again affect the references, the books, the materials, and the people that you use as quote sources for your presentation. Last, getting to the very root of technical questions. What programming languages are they going to know? This plays well to the past five questions that you've seen, but do they only know HTML, CSS, JavaScript? 
or does it include a little bit farther back into the Ruby, Java, Perl, Python, C, C++, or let's rewind even further, COBOL, ALGOL, LISP, FORTRAN. You need to know this to give a presentation that resonates well with the audience. With that data collected, your next task is to craft a story around it. And when I say a story, I sincerely mean that. We have a structure from the 1800s that works really well, not only for Hollywood movies, but for technical talks. The Freitag Pyramid. And this pyramid and the various points in it all have names. And if thinking about your story having a rising action, complication, kind of a top point of where the tension is highest, and then as you slide down that curve, some resolution, and then a finale, Freitag's pyramid can be a little intimidating at first, thinking about everything from the exposition to the peak of the story, and then following all the way back down through the resolution and denouement. If a simpler view of this allows you to map your story onto the story arc, then just look at points one, four, and seven, kind of the exposition, what are we about to embark on here, the climax, the, the peak of difficulty, struggle, perhaps the solution in motion, and then a nice soft conclusion at the end where people feel the liberty to draw their own conclusions, but you've given them a solid answer to your particular path through this journey. With the story figured out, you start to enter the phase of mechanics. You need to write the proposal and actually put it into the call for paper system. And when you're doing so, having been a reviewer for a lot of conferences in the past and just personally knowing what resonates well with me when I'm reading these proposals, I suggest that you focus on the impact that every word has. By that, I mean trim down the length of what you're offering as a proposal and make it more power packed. You have several different links to think about here, and each of them needs to be as brief as possible, but there's kind of an upper bound to these three things that are commonly asked for on these submission forms to conferences. The title, which kind of my governance for this is between four and eight words. And I know that sounds extremely constraining, but that's something that fits well into a printed guide or maybe even the mobile edition of the conference's schedule. Then you have an abstract. Several sentences, and for me, between two and four sentences seems to be about where I like it the most, that describe in just a teasing fashion the technologies, the story, the type, the interactions, the team, the background, the era that this presentation will be focused on. And then the full exposition, the description of the whole talk. But when I say description, this doesn't necessarily need to be a full-fledged outline or literally a script that could be read from. This just needs to be a little bit more depth to draw someone in who was attracted by the title who thought the abstract mentioned something that they would benefit from and clarifies just a bit further who the right audience is and who will benefit the most from sitting in on the full 30, 40, 60 minutes or however long your talk happens to be. You're clarifying, making sure that people who thought they were interested will get a good experience out of sitting through the entire presentation. Now, if you're thinking this is hard, you're right. But it's not as if you have to start from a clean slate. You do have to think from first principles how you want to present your story, your flavor about whatever technology or process that you've chosen to talk about. But there's nothing wrong in the least of getting inspiration from other ones that have resonated well with past audiences and have been successful at other conferences. Look back, such as this URL that I have in the bottom right-hand corner, at ones that received high ratings. It's pretty easy to sift those out. It's pretty easy to see which ones that you, if you temporarily place yourself in the shoes of a proposal reviewer, are most impacted by. And then look why that is. Is it the words they've chosen? Is it the density of phrases that they've used? The grab that they put at the beginning of that abstract? Maybe all three and do your best to map that onto your technology topic. With the proposal built and submitted, now's the time to get your marketing engine running. 
Many presenters think that this is solely the job of the conference and their PR team, but you're going to benefit from giving this talk as much as the conference or the event is. So do your best to fill all of those seats. No one knows that you're giving this talk if you don't get the message out there. I'm not trying to sound like a marketing firm, but it's part of your job here, along with delivering an excellent presentation to make sure that the right audiences, the people who would benefit the most from it, are aware and perhaps send it around internally in their own mailing lists and groups. Lanyard is one of the great places to advertise that. It's getting more and more traffic and people are able to search by keywords and global location. But also, use the traditional, and traditional I mean in the 2013 era, social media channels to get the message out about this conference, this event, this particular talk that you're delivering, and allow people to become interested and engaged even before you're actually up there on stage. Next, with the marketing engine running, you have a bit of implementation to return your attention to. That is actually designing the talk. But I chose that word carefully, designing, because I see this as a very separate task from the implementation of the talk itself, the putting together of, let's say, the slides or the code demos. I try to use a constraining approach to this and that I use a very particular writing instrument in a very particularly sized writing destination. I use a small little moleskin notebook and I use a one millimeter felt pen. And that seems like a kind of ridiculous prescription. But the reason that I choose these two is it means that I'm thinking in kind of bite-sized pieces. I don't have huge legal-sized pieces of paper to write on. And I can't do a whole lot of detail if I use a felt pen. I find that the large pen and this constrained paper size allows me to just think on the big ideas and to sketch really quickly and really loosely what I want this talk to be about. I defer actually putting these ideas, mind maps, concepts, little bubbles, just random notes in the corner of the paper, in order until the last responsible moment. I just try to collect everything that I think would benefit the audience on this topic that I'm speaking on. Then, when I'm in the organizing phase, when I feel like I have a good corpus of ideas and little bubbles drawn out, I'll put them in two levels of organization. After all, a talk is ultimately linear as determined by the wall clock. So I group them by topic. I usually try to keep that between three and five in any given talk, three segments. And then within each segment, I organize those five, seven, maybe 10 at most little micro ideas and put those in some order that also looks like I'm revealing it by peeling back the layers of this complex topic's onion skin. The seventh step in this process is to actually construct the talk. Some presenters that I speak to have a difficult time understanding the separation between designing it and building it. But the separation is extreme. This can be deferred until very late in the process because you have your ideas, you know what you're going to talk about, You've even organized it into the order in which you lay it out for the audience. You know why you're speaking to them. You know a bit about them. You've in fact started to even think about the actual audience members and how you're going to tell the story for maximum impact. And now you merely have to build a few visuals to both cue you and the audience members along this story arc. Don't forget, you can give an excellent presentation without any visuals in the background. One of the presentations that I remember as some, one of the most significant that I've ever attended was by Kent Beck in Sweden. It had just three slides, and he spoke to it for over 45 minutes with the audience packed to capacity, enraptured, and learning an amazing amount about test-driven development and how we could shorten our release cycles because he knew who he was speaking to, he knew exactly what he wanted to teach us, and a minimal amount of visuals in the background were just a support. The story was Kent. Your situation can be exactly the same. With a great story and a great subject and having thought a lot about the audience, the visuals 
are merely just a cue to progress you along the length of your talk. If in doubt, go to the simple end of the spectrum. Don't add one more piece of clip art. Don't use a third and fourth font. Don't get wrapped up in the selection of colors where that is now stealing away from the time of a great story. Now, a few tools can help you with those pieces. I didn't say ignore the colors or ignore the photos, but let those be secondary to having a great story. And the two tools that I find myself coming back to time and time again are color.adobe.com, a very useful web-based tool that allows you to choose color patterns and harmonies, and even bring those into some of your presentation tools like PowerPoint and Keynote, and then extracting some great design ideas from people who do this for a living. And over on the Speaker Deck website, you'll find that there's actually some feature presentations, and these are the ones that really just shine. A great use of everything from hand-drawn diagram style to a minimal set of colors on a chalkboard to one that goes ultra sparse, this one by John Rohan, that has just an orange and white palette with a few supporting screenshots of both code and a website. With the presentation constructed, you think you could breathe a sigh of relief. Now all you need to do is show up at the venue and give the talk on the day of the event. I hope not. You need to practice the talk. This is an important step to giving an excellent presentation because things happen at the venue. Projector bulbs blow out, laptops stop working, slides can't be projected, the USB stick suddenly won't read your keynote or PowerPoint file. But if you practice your presentation, even once or twice, and if you have a printed copy of it with you, I know, not quite the green cool thing to do, but with that copy in hand, you can still deliver an excellent value to the attendees that are sitting in those chairs. The slides, as I said just a few minutes ago, are just a supporting tool. What amazes me is with an informal survey that I took during the construction of that presentation patterns book, well-known presenters, frequent presenters, presenters at very important national congresses, only about 10% even practiced their talk once. That's amazing. Think of the impact to the quality, to the benefit of the audience if the other 90% even spent the time to go through their presentation just once from beginning to end. I hear a lot of hallway chatter before presentations with people wishing each other luck that is not a preparation technique, and I hope you really reduce your reliance on this. You know this material, it's important to you, you know something about the audience, and effectively, you're just having a chat with them. That lowers the stress level so much. You're just having a conversation about a topic with, say, a couple hundred people. The scale is just a little bit bigger. When you're actually delivering the presentation, you think that you've done as much as you can to prepare, but there's a few on-premise adjustments that you can make that will increase your level of success and, in fact, draw the audience more into your story. Placing friends in the front row is one of the best hacks that I've done time and time again. These are people who have a vested interest in the success of the talk. These are people who are rooting for you. These are people who are going to pay attention. These are people who may have even reviewed your presentation materials in advance of the talk. They're going to clap, applaud, give you eye contact, perhaps even ask questions. And that has been shown through many studies outside even the presentation space to affect the rest of the room. The people in the rows back are being somewhat controlled by the behavior of the people in the front of the room. They'll involuntarily agree. They'll clap when the front row claps. They'll nod in agreement when the front row nods. Getting what we feel like is towards the final steps of a presentation is delivering the talk. Now, why isn't this step number 10? Because we have a little bit of after activity, even after we've landed a perfect presentation. But in the midst of delivering that talk, 
let's kind of steer away from the classical and I deem them somewhat silly analogies and think about the fact that everyone in the audience wants you to succeed. That's not some motivational Tony Robbins statement. That is just truth. They're in the room because they expect to learn something from you. They're in the room because the abstract sounded interesting. They're in the room because they expect to walk away better informed, a little bit smarter, and with some new knowledge to take back to their team members after your talk is done. And I like that attitude because when you ask questions of the audience, when you're looking for them to, to validate some of your thoughts on a topic, remember that they came into the room expecting a good outcome. With the talk successfully in your rearview mirror, you're done, right? But not quite. A responsible presenter has one more activity to think about, and that is gathering feedback. This can be done for a number of reasons, but it's not just for you to improve the next time. It certainly is for that, but not solely for that. People today have so many outlets in which they can provide their sentiments about your presentation. Facebook, Twitter, perhaps even on the website of the conference itself. But you should take charge of that. You should control where they're giving that feedback as much as possible. Now, control is probably too strong a word. What I mean is route it. And you can route it very easily by providing them your preferred means of speaking with you. Give them an email address, or perhaps, in my opinion, even better, give them a publicly visible channel. I give my Twitter handle throughout my presentation, and I like people to use that. I sincerely care what they think about the talk. That goes all the way back to the beginning. Know the audience, and deeply care about the topic. So of course you care what the audience thought about your delivery of it. This for the people who are less than pleased with your talk, and there always will be a few, gives them a place to send that criticism. Rather than venting it out at the greater world of, this talk was awful, I got nothing from it, the presenter had all kinds of incorrect facts, they're sending those complaints, whether true or not, directly to you, and most of the time, the most vitriolic of these correspondents merely want the validation of being heard. If you respond to them, they typically have far less reason to go out and be angry in the hallway and in other forms. They've been heard and you've acknowledged those concerns. One of the most frequent complaints but can easily be solved is the duration of your presentation. People have other things that they must attend to. Conference calls that they must make back to the office, even while at a trade show or a convention. Emails that they have to attend to in between the hallway breaks. Other talks that they want to attend that are adjacent to yours. So one of the things that you can do to most delight your audiences above and beyond a great exposition on your story is to end as close as possible to on time. Maybe even a few minutes early. Not so much so that they feel like they didn't get their money's worth from their stopwatch of the 40, 50, 60 minutes that the presentation promised to be, but things happen. A clicker that temporarily stops responding, a slide that freezes up and you have to reopen the presentation, or worst case, a machine that you have to reboot to get the presentation back up. Give yourself a little tiny bit of padding at the end, maybe about 5%. Invite even the most introverted individuals to come up to the stage and ask you questions one-on-one -on -one if they're a little uncomfortable to, say, use the microphone and ask them in the full audience view. That is a way to get yourself just a few more satisfaction points with the audience. Along those same lines, two more things to ask of you at the end. One. If you've been inspired to propose a talk to a show, might I direct you over to submit to the call for papers for OSCON. It's always a very inclusive show in which people from all over the planet are coming to talk about their best practices, their experiences, and the technologies that they're using. We'd love to see your proposal on that list. And second, I'd love your feedback about this talk and presentation. 
the things that you agree with and even the things that you disagree with. And I'd love to hear if this inspired you to submit a proposal to an event. The world will benefit from your effort of teaching.